Welcome back, everyone. Glad to have you here for part two of our Cabral host calls every single weekend, answering our community's questions. Looking forward to diving back in all things wellness, weight loss, weight gain, anti-aging, and everything in between, as we say. So yesterday, we went over some great questions. Hopefully, you were able to tune in. That was episode 2290. We went over uh, what to do for slower bowel uh, movements, gallbladder removal, urinary tract, uh, related to the same. We went through fatigue, uh, vertigo, headaches, muscle spasms, numbness in the hands, tongue, lips. We went over potential mold toxicity. We went over lower thyroid and Hashimoto's. We talked about lightheadedness and dizziness, especially as we start to get maybe a little bit older. And we also talked about uh, my formulations for cell boost and nicotinamide riboside versus nicotinamide mononucleotide. Uh, and that was yesterday. So hopefully you tuned in. That was episode 2290. If you want to check out today's questions and maybe read along as we go, head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2291 for today's show. All right, let's dive right in. First question is from Nina. Nina says, Hello, Dr. Brawl. First, I'd just like to thank you for everything you do and share with this community. You've helped so many people with your knowledge and passion to help others. Thank you, Nina. I appreciate that. I'm a 36-year-old female. I recently recovered from candida overgrowth, blastocystis, vitamin mineral deficiencies, and a few other gut issues. I recently took a saliva hormone test and has very low levels of estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone. My DHEA were was on the very low end of normal and my cortisol levels were in the normal range. Could this be a case of my body recovering and catching up? What do you recommend to rebalance my hormones? Thank you again for all you do. All right. Yeah, happy to answer this. So I don't know, Nina, if you're an IHP level two or not. Um, If you're not, and you're really interested in this, I would look into becoming an IHP. Um, But if not, and you're not, I would work with either one of our coaches uh, or one of the IHP level twos, um, because whoever you worked with on this lab should have told you all of this. And again, I don't mean this from a negative standpoint. I'm not trying to put anybody down, but People need to be told what their labs mean, not just if they're in range. So if you're working with a doctor or a health coach or a dietitian or anyone, and they don't tell you what your labs mean, especially if you're like in range but almost out of range, then you ask them. And if they can't tell you, then it it doesn't mean they're a bad person, but it's probably not the person to be working on when health is the most important thing in our lives, right? So that's why I teach this. I think it's very important that we all learn this, but even still, um, this is, this is important because, okay, let's go through this. And, and I'm glad that you're working on your candida, your parasite, vitamin minerals, all those other amazing things. So you're doing great. So if your DHEA is low, and your estrogen is low, and your progesterone is low, and your cortisol is low, then it means that your body was under chronic stress for a number of years, or it could be a number of months, but typically years. Like, it's a chronic issue. Okay. How do you know if you're recovering? Well, cortisol in the normal range, especially in the AM range, if, if AM is low, So I'm hoping that you did four to cortisol levels during the day, because if you only did one, then it doesn't give you the full picture. But if cortisol is normal, okay, it could be a sign that your body is recovering. Could be a sign. But it also could be a sign that your body's still under stress. The only way that anyone would ever be able to tell you if you're recovering or you're still in that stress state is if you had a previous lab from six months or a year ago showing what your cortisol levels were like then. If your cortisol levels were low then, especially in the AM well, then you're now on the recovery or at least moving in the right direction. But either way, honestly, I'm not sure that it totally matters because your body needs a lot more support, okay? So I can't tell you exactly what to do because I don't have your whole health history. I didn't do your intake, but that's why your practitioner should be giving you recommendations. Again, you need to be working on, um, yes, your digestion, no doubt about it, but the nervous system and all the things that would enable you for that full recovery. So either work with an integrative health practitioner level two, uh, work with a naturopathic doctor that specializes in this, or work with someone on our Equal Life team. All right, and then uh, without a doubt, though, you'll get the you'll get the protocol and help that you need. No doubt about it. It sounds like you're doing great though. So keep up the great work. 
Okay, so Lori's up next. Hi, Dr. Ball. I'm currently enrolled in your IHP2 program. Well, look at that. <laughs> Again, I don't read these questions at all before we even start. Um, you just became level one certified. Congratulations. You recently, I was recently discussing one of your podcasts with a naturopathic doctor regarding COVID in the gut, and she mentioned she has seen a lot of pancreatitis in patients after COVID also. Wondering if this is something you have encountered, and if so, can you speak in this topic on one of your podcasts? Please advise, sincerely, Lori. Uh, sincerely, Lori. All right, great question. Um, so I have not seen a lot of pancreatitis. I really haven't, uh, but I'm not surprised because I've seen a lot of inflammation. So the inflammation could affect the vagal nerve, why so many people are dealing with lightheadedness, brain fog, fatigue. Also, just inflammation in general wipes out your mitochondria. I have a lot of podcasts in this, Lori. Um, I would love for you to check those out and maybe even forward them to your ND if you want. You don't have to, of course, because... I know, like, there's just a lot of ego in medicine. You probably have a great ND, and they're willing to go back and forth and talk about it. But it's just, uh, I love open discussions. I love friendly debate. That's how we learn, right? That's the little why I read. If you can see in my book right now, I have literally stacks of books. Um, I'm trying, they're literally so big <laughs> that you can see here on the podcast if you're seeing this in video. This is just two. Um, these are monster books, and I love to read, and and I've read thousands of books. And so people say, why do you still read? Because the thing is, I always try to keep my mind open. Maybe there's something I missed. And oftentimes there is. And so I just continue to study. I continue to read. Um, okay, so that's that. So definitely check out my podcast because um, if we're talking about overall inflammatory processes, long haulers, long COVID, whatever you want to call it, um, you want to understand the underlying principles. Inflammation, depleted mitochondria, depleted mitochondria leads to more inflammation. It's a vicious cycle. It can affect any part of your body. And you also have to start working on just overall boosting your immune system. So hopefully that's helpful. Thank you for writing in. Catherine's up next. Dear Dr. Brawl, I have vitiligo and there is no cure. It really depresses me. Do you have any suggestions? I try to be gluten-free, no dairy, eggs, and low-carb, low-fat but nothing helps, only direct sun exposure in the summer. I feel helpless, thanks for your time. All right, so we might have got a little bit of an answer there because by the way, there is cures for vitiligo. So um, vitiligo is essentially a, um, what's the best way to call it? A depigmentation of the skin. So it doesn't matter what color your skin color is, it can become, it can have lighter patches, white patches on the skin. So it does go back to, though, I see many people with candida and yeast overgrowth as part of the issue. I see many people with mold as part of the issue. Uh, I see many people with some heavy metals as part of the issue. But overall, it's going back to autoimmune-based processes. So vitamin D plays a big part in that. Now, is vitamin D going to cure all of vitiligo? Well, first, let me give you my medical disclaimer. I'm not here to provide any medical advice, medical, di medical diagnosis, medical treatment plans, or medical cures. I look at underlying root causes. So what I do is this, um, Catherine. There's a cure for everything, by the way. Again, we know this because if one person has recovered from vitiligo, that means, okay, there is a way to overcome it. So what we look at is the underlying root causes. We run the big five labs. You can run them with a naturopathic doctor. You can run them with an integrative health practitioner level two. You can run them with our Equalife team. It's your choice. Honestly, your choice. All the labs are at stephencabral.com forward slash labs. You can see what they are. You don't have to run them with us if you choose not to. Here's the thing. We need to look at what your vitamin levels, really important. Vitamin D is a big one. Maybe the sun is helping you with that, okay? For mood and body. All right, My mind and body. So then we look at your zinc levels. What do your zinc levels look like? What do your vitamin C levels look like? Do you have uh, candida overgrowth? Do you have potential mold exposure? What are your omega-6s to omega-3s like? Do you have gut permeability? We need to assess these things in order to figure out your underlying root cause. That's the only way anybody gets well. It's honestly, if you got well without doing that, you got lucky, and you know what? Congratulations, that's fantastic. It's okay to be lucky sometimes, it really is, right? But if it happens again, you didn't know how you got well again. So that's what I can tell people. If you end up relapsing or you're getting sick and you already got well and you already know what the underlying root causes are, you can do it again. That's the beauty. Now, like for me personally, I was always worried through my entire 20s about getting sick, always. Because it could be a full relapse. And, but then once I figured out how I got sick and why I was sick, I, never, I don't never worry about getting sick again, ever. 
like literally ever. So now we can get a cold and it's like it's going on and for a long cold for me, it'd be five days. Okay, on the fifth day, I'm like, well, I'm still going to get well again. Like this is a temporary period of time and I wish I wasn't sick, but I get a cold because I'm human, right? And so that happens. So hopefully that's helpful, Catherine. A little sip of smoothie there. Purple crush smoothie. Just saying, I practice what I preach. Staying healthy. It's hard to imagine, right? If you're watching this on video, you can see it, but hard to imagine that some people believe that wild blueberries were dark purple pigment like this, all those anthocyanins that have been proven to help prevent cancer, help with your eyes, your nervous system, and so much more that this is somehow harmful to the body. But that is the world that we live in where anybody can say anything, especially some of those people are doctors, which is amazing. Anyway, <clears throat> Jillian's up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. This may seem random, but I'm wondering if you have any knowledge on sandbox health safety for children. I've been debating on getting one for my toddler, and I've heard some people mention they can be unsanitary and harbor parasites. We would keep it covered when not used. I've also heard some people use diatomaceous earth, but I've also heard it can be harmful. What are your thoughts? Jillian, this is a great question. I've never been asked this before, and I love being asked questions I've never been asked before. Like, for example, let me just go back for one second. Catherine, if you go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast, you could type in vitiligo, and you'll see all the podcasts I've done on vitiligo for even more information. I've never done one on Sandbox Health, so let's do it. Let's go over this. Well, this is something I, of course, looked into because I now have a seven and nine-year-old daughter, but at what one time they were at Sandbox age, and um, here's what you want to do. Sandboxes can be literally littered with mice droppings, animal droppings. By that, I mean their uh, bowel movements, their poop in the sandbox, right? If it's left outside, um, that can be urine, that can be uh, obviously bowel movement based, and, and you can have all sorts of bacteria and parasites in there, no doubt about it. So what do you do? Well, first, you cover the earth below with a liner so that nothing can come through from the, from the dirt, okay? Next, you're going to fill it with sand in some type of container, wood, uh, plastic, whatever you decide is best for you. The, obviously, plastic's not great for the environment, but it's there, and if you choose to do it, your child's not going to be eating the plastic or consuming it. Anyway, you need a liner. Okay, next, you do have a cover for it every night. Absolutely, that's what you want to do. <clears throat> Keep it covered. Only time you don't have it um, covered is when your child's playing in it, in it. And if anybody else is doing it, you do the same thing. But also, I agree, food-based diatomaceous earth is excellent. Not the synthetic, not the filtered form, but the food grade, just type in food grade diatomaceous earth. Why is it not harmful to humans, but it is to parasites? Because it affects anything with an exoskeleton. If the skeleton is on the outside of the body, it has a crystalline based structure and it will break down those parasites. People even consume it internally. I'm not recommending it, but nevertheless, it's a recommendation that some people give with parasites. We do something a little different called our Parapro Support Protocol for Parasites. Um, but uh, so that's what I'd recommend. That's what we did. And um, yeah, so hopefully that's helpful. All right. Barbie is up next. Barbie says, hello, I am in desperate need for Dr. Brawl to help me. He seems so knowledgeable and so nice. I've spent thousands of dollars on trying to get better and figure out what the cause is to my health issues. And nobody, not even naturopaths, have seen, can find it. I've seen, can find it. My prayer to God is to please, can I somehow talk to Dr. Brawl? Can he please help me? All right, Barbie. Well, you've asked in the Ask Cabral. Um, appreciate the kind words. And I'm always, always here to help. So although I do not do one-on-one -on -one consultations anymore, and the reason being is this, I've done one-on-one -on -one consultations my entire life for 20 years. I saw well over 40,000 client appointments um, in my own uh, practice, but I oversee over, I've overseen over a quarter million. And every month I oversee 1,000 to 2,000 appointments. In a month, the biggest month I could do is maybe 160 hours, right? 40 hours a week. So just keep in mind that I'm just trying to do my highest good possible. And I feel that's overseeing our team now that's like 20 people. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing team. Here's the nice thing though. I give 
my guidance on any questions they have. So if it's a case we haven't seen before, or if someone's struggling, they ask me on our Monday and Thursday calls. So I'm always happy to help in that way. I understand we've seen many, many people that have spent thousands of dollars and seen dozens of practitioners just like I did, just like many of the coaches on my team. The very best thing that you could do is either get a do the free lab consult, which is $49, but the $49 gets put towards any labs you want, or do the private wellness coaching with one of our Equal Life coaches if you want to work directly again with our team, or you can run the big five. I know there's an investment, but we really make it as inexpensive as possible, and we include a 90-minute consultation with the big five labs. So you can find that at stephencabral.com forward slash labs or directly at stephencabral.com forward slash big five. That is the way that you can work with me and my team. I know you've worked with naturopaths before. Not everyone has the same expertise in every area. doesn't mean that they're bad people. doesn't mean that they're not great. Just means like you haven't seen the right one for you. That's all. Um, you can also work with our integrative health practitioners. A level two practitioner will be able to run at home labs with you. So my opinion is this. Let's find the root cause. Let's run the big five. Let's go deeper. Have someone to support you along the way. That's absolutely my, my best recommendation. All right. So stephencabral.com forward slash health dash coaching or stephencabral.com forward slash big five. And that'll lead you to the right place. And we'll do our very best for you. We, we really will. We'll do our very best. Okay, our last question of the day is from Summer. Summer is saying, hey, doc, I have gut dysbiosis, possibly SIBO and leaky gut. I've gotten rid of H. pylori and now mid-CBO protocol. I've been doing coffee enemas on and off for a few years with a clean organic coffee. Larry, I tried to do around once a week for extra liver support. I'm assuming that that's just a typo, but you're doing it once a week for liver support. Got it? I always feel great after, but more often than not, a few hours to a half a day later, I'll experience terrible bloating. I feel like a huge gas bubble or something that won't move. I usually end up doing an enema, another enema to move it through. I usually do two rounds of about six to eight cups of distilled water, then about four cups of coffee. I started using less water thinking I was just using too much and not being able to move it all back out, but it's still causing problems most times. Any idea what might be causing the bloating and discomfort? Thanks for everything. All right, this is interesting because I don't exactly know the coffee enema that you are doing. My recommended coffee enema is the same one as the Gerson Institute. That's how I learned it. So three tablespoons of organic coffee mixed with one liter of distilled water. You could do spring water if you needed to. And then, and we typically do spring water at my house because you don't always have distilled water there. You could do reverse osmosis if you wanted to. And then um, what you're going to do is put it in a French press. Okay, that's it. Let it, um, well, marinate as the best way to say. Then press it down after five or 10 minutes, <clears throat> however strong you want it to be. Then let it cool. And that, that's really it. So that's all we do. Three tablespoons, heaping tablespoons. Uh, if it makes you too jittery after doing a coffee enema, you'll use less than three tablespoons. Maybe you use one to start, and then two, and then try three. So you absolutely may be doing too much water. You're doing six to eight cups, and then you're doing, I think, another four cups of coffee. So uh, that's somewhere around 10 to 12 cups. So that would be, that would be, yeah, that would be a lot of water. So I think you just might be using too much water for sure. Now, there's another possibility, and that's that some people, if they're more prone to constipation, once they do a coffee enema, they have a little slower bowel transit time. It typically doesn't happen unless people are doing coffee enemas every day, because then your body gets used to the stimulant. And then when you get used to the stimulant, your body looks for that stimulant again in order to be able to have a bowel movement. So that doesn't happen to everybody. It's not even 10% not even of people. It might be like one or two percent of people, but they're out there. And so you have to be careful with that. And, and for those people, you just might use again less caffeine. So you might use less coffee. So that seems like the place to start. I would I would definitely look into just using a one liter French press that's about 32, 33 ounces, uh, three tablespoons, heaping tablespoons of organic coffee. You know, let it let it simmer for 10 minutes or so, longer if you want it stronger, press it down, wait for it to cool. Pour it in your coffee enema bucket, and you are good to go. I also have a podcast on coffee enemas, so you can go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast, 
Type in coffee enema and you'll be able to find it. All right. Hopefully this was helpful. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning into today's show. I always appreciate you. I'll be back tomorrow with our Mindset and Motivation Monday. Don't miss it.